Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of The Rock Experience with Mike Brunn. On this episode, I'm excited and honored to have joining me the legendary and incredible Giza Butler. We're going to talk all about his newest book, Into the Void. This is a great read. I highly, highly recommend it. He'll share with us during this chat some stories about working with Ozzy, working with Dio, almost reuniting last year with both Tony and Ozzy for a performance and why that didn't happen, and so much more. This is a great conversation. I know you guys are going to really enjoy this. So let's jump in and let's get started. Thank you. I have to just start off by saying it's an absolute honor to have you on the show today to talk about your book and your amazing career. So thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So I just want to congratulate you on the new book, Into the Void, just recently released. You, in the book, you mentioned and you know, a few times that you're a private person. Was it harder for you to open up and write a book as opposed to writing so many great lyrics, so many incredible rock songs over the years? Yeah, it was. Um, I kept like saying, no, I don't want it to come Right. No, I don't want it published. No, I don't want it published. And they kept saying, "Why you got to do it? You got to do it for the fans." Because, because I, I wrote the lyrics. A lot of the Sabbath fans have always asked me to write a book, mm -hmm. and because um, Ozzy's written one, Tony's written one, Bill Ward's writing one now, and I, I just thought it was the right time for me to do it. Yeah, no, look, I agree, and I, you know, I'll say thank you to your wife for pushing you to get it out there and to release it publicly because it's an absolutely great read. I certainly recommend all the fans to go out there and buy it. You know, one, one of you. the, yes. One, one of the things I love is, you know, just touching on the early days of black Sabbath. Right. And you talk about in the book that the imagery of that first album, right. That classic album cover, the band name itself, the gatefolds on the album that all led to the band being quote unquote misunderstood. Did that bother you at the time that the band was so misunderstood or did you feel like at that point, you know, any press is good press. It, it was no, it just pissed us off because um, they kept like saying that we we're promoting Satanism, and it was exactly the opposite. The song Black Sabbath is a song warning people against getting involved with that uh, Satanism and black magic and everything because you know bad things happen when you do get involved in that kind of stuff, and. Off that we were totally misrepresented by the in the press. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, you mentioned that song Black Sabbath, right? So, so many people over the years and the decades have said that in some ways that's the most important heavy metal song. Other people have said it's the first heavy metal song. Do you agree with the importance that so many fans place on that particular song? I think so, because it was completely different to anything else that came before it. You know, it was slow and totally strange timing um it, it was unlike anything else anybody was doing at that particular time or up until up until that time and um yeah i think that was the beginning of something different totally agree now you know many rock fans know that you were the one that wrote the lyrics to so many of these great songs and you say in the book that you were chosen to be the one to write the lyrics because you were the quote-unquote brainy one now, to me, it's much it's much different being an accountant, and I can talk to that because I am an accountant, right? It's much different being an accountant as opposed to being you know, the lyricist of a heavy metal, hard rock band. Did it come easy to you to write these lyrics for these great songs? Yeah, it did, because I was the only one in the band that was, was always reading books and stuff like that. And I, I always liked uh, English literature and English language when I was at school. I was good at those subjects, so... Um, 
it came naturally to me, I suppose. I was always writing poems and uh, little stories and stuff. Um, so when it came to writing lyrics, it came quite easy to me. Mm. Now, but, you know, I love in the book that you say, and you want to make sure that Ozzy gets the credit right in the melodies of the song, which, you know, I always think that's equally as important. Um, but were there times when Ozzy came to you with a melody of a song and you were like, you know what, hey, Oz, I just don't feel that and you had to change it or, you know, kind of just not go with what he originally suggested? No, not at all. I always thought Oz Ozzy was a genius for coming up with the melodies that he did, and especially on songs like Black Sabbath, which is like, so it must have been so hard. It was natural for him, but um, it's a very strange uh, song to sing, to, to make up a melody to sing to. And um, he was always brilliant at doing that. And it was usually right off the top of his head. He'd come out with his great melodies. And um, I think that's what made it easy for me to, because there was so much emotion in it, so much feeling that he used to put in it, that it was easy for me to put the lyrics to it. Okay, sure. Now, obviously, Ozzy, especially all these years later, is a larger-than-life character. Tony is the riff master, right? Everybody always compliments him. Do you feel you get the credit you deserve as being the main lyricist and the bass player in Black Sabbath? Yeah, I think uh, people that know Sabbath, um, you know, always that know that I was the lyricist. And uh, a lot of bands over the years have cited, especially bass players, seem to cite me as one of their main influences. And a lot of the um, lyric, ly lyrical ideas that bands come out with stem from early Sabbath stuff. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's certainly there's so many artists that give you guys credit as a major influence. And I even think of something like the grunge era in the 90s. So many people either loved it grunge or hated grunge but so many people also pointed to saying that it was influenced heavily by sabbath did you agree with that and did you like the grunge movement yeah i love it. particularly soundgarden i really love soundgarden and stuff and i always noticed the influence <laughs> that sabbath had on their kind of stuff even the lyric content and and dave grohl's always said that sabbath were a massive influence on nirvana and yeah. so you know it's, it's just what people have said to me so yeah. is there anybody that said they were an influence that surprised you um i can't really think off the top of my head okay fair enough i know when i was reading your book you mentioned the show where kiss opened for you guys in 75 and i remember reading ozzy's book that you referenced before and ozzy saying that that's the first time he knew he had to leave the band because you guys felt scared to you know kind of go on after kiss is that Ozzy overreacting, or did that show really have a, an influence on the band? Well, yeah, up until that time, hardly anybody had any kind of a stage show, and um, we'd never seen anything like it. I mean, it, it was like unheard of to have flames and fire on stage and explosions and all that kind of thing. It was the first time I'd ever seen a band put on that kind of a, a massive show. Usually, bands would just walk on, plug their amps in, and play, and that was the standard form up until that, until Kiss came along, yep. and um, and there was Alice Cooper, of course, but uh, I think Kiss took it that much further than Alice Cooper. Yeah, no, without a doubt. Now you mentioned before how the song Black Sabbath is misinterpreted by people, and I love this uh, reading the book because I honestly I never knew this that the song Iron Man was actually based off of Jesus. So just talk about that for a moment, because that blew my mind as I'm reading that. Yeah, well, I was brought up a very strict uh, Catholic, and um, um, I, was, I just based it on when Jesus uh, went into, I think it was went into Jerusalem, or I think uh, on Palm Sunday, as it is in the Catholic Church, and he was like welcomed as a new savior and everything. And by the end of the week, people had turned against him and crucified him. And so I based the same thing on Iron Man. The Iron Man had gone into space and he, he saw what he sort of traveled through time and mm. saw what was happening with the earth and came back to war warn people. And people just laughed at him. And <laughs> rather, instead of like Jesus forgiving everybody, Iron Man takes his revenge on everyone. Mm. I love it. I would have never thought that Jesus was the influence of that song. Now, to me, again, another part in the book, which kind of blew my mind, is you talk about in the late 70s, 
where the band was trying to trying to decide like, hey, should we go down a road of like being a softer rock band, like the Journeys that are popular at the time, or should we follow the hard rock stuff, like the punk rock bands that are out there right now? Did you feel at that point Sabbath was maybe becoming a little bit more of a follower as opposed to the trendset as you guys were in the early 70s? I think we were running out of ideas. Um, we had, I think the, what caused it was uh, when we found out we were being ripped off so badly <laughs> and uh, we had... We'd done all these massive tours, sold millions and millions of albums, and we had nothing in the bank to show for it. It was all gone. And the the uh, the lowest point came when we, the tax man sent us <laughs> the bill for, for all this money that we'd never seen. And we had to, like, uh, put everything into paying back taxes for money that we'd never seen. So uh, and I think it just wore the band down. And trying to get away from the management, we had to go through, uh, when we were doing the Sabotage, the album, which is why we called it Sabotage, mm -hmm. there was lawyers coming in uh, to the studio every day and we'd been subpoenaed for this and subpoenaed for that and sued for this and sued for that. And it's just it just destroyed us. And um, I think the music started to suffer and uh, a lot of the bands that were supporting us were more 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 melodic, like Boston, and they were like selling loads of albums. Warner Brothers had sort of lost interest in us. Uh, they were, you know, they were promoting Van Halen, and um, we just sort of uh, were confused about what direction to go in. I think when punk came along, it, it brought back the rawness and the, the hard hitting lyrics that we were sort of losing. And um, and we we weren't uh, there was nobody in the band to say right this is the direction we're going to go in let's do that uh, that are gone and it was like we were all confused e each one of us was like well what direction do we go in now and um, and that's what led to the breakup really sure now you mentioned Van Halen and obviously they opened for you on the Never Say Die tour there's been a lot of press over the years and fans saying that, hey, Van Halen was better than Sabbath was on that tour. Other people say, no, Sabbath the Sabbath, they were better. What's your what's your take? Do you think you would have better band on a nightly basis with Van Halen on that tour? I wouldn't say better, but, we, you know, we certainly held our own because, you know, people were coming to – it was the Sabbath following that was coming, and yeah. uh, a lot of them, when Van Halen were, went on, they were surprised at how good Van Halen were. And we were fans of Van Halen as well. Yep. And the two bands got on like houses on fire. We we got on great with each other, and we used to party every night. <laughs> and <laughs> um, yeah, so we didn't. Tony and uh, Eddie got on great. Uh, at first, Tony was a bit pissed off that Eddie was doing these longer and longer guitar solos, and Ozzy was uh, peeved that Dave Lee Roth was going out and using all Ozzy's. Uh, things um yep. i think that really started uh getting us down in the end and you know some people love sabbath some people love van halen um the one thing the rec the record company was out and out promoting van halen we were on the same record company but all the all the uh backing was going into van halen they were forgetting about us yeah so now, yeah i think i think it was just a good show all around oh i so, agree I fully agree. You know, you talked about, you know, like Sabbath was a little bit more on the decline at that point. Yet for me, my introduction to the band actually was the Mob Rules album. Right. And I know it's a couple of years later. And then from there, I worked my way backwards. Now, obviously, at that point, Dio was in the band. Would you say Dio helped resurrect and save Black Sabbath at that point? Absolutely. Ronnie was the perfect the just the thing that we needed to come into the band. He was so full of enthusiasm and ideas. And um, getting rid of Ozzy was like, the, we were all really low. We didn't know what, if we, we were going to carry on or anything like that. And then Ronnie came in and we'd already written things like Children of the Sea and some of the things that later turned up on the Heaven and Hell album. But we didn't have any vocals on it. And Ronnie came in, listened to the uh, the idea for Children of the Sea and Camp was incredible vocal. And of course he wrote his own lyrics as well. So that um that gave me time to concentrate on what I was doing on bass, more on the music side of things. And it was just such a breath of fresh air. And he enthused all of us. Hmm. 
Now, I know what one of the things that surprised me in the book is a few years prior to that in 77, you talk about actually being fired from the band for a few weeks, which I honestly, I never knew. I knew Ozzy had left for a few months and there was a talk about the two of you maybe doing an album together. Was that ever a strong consideration or was it just kind of talk amongst bandmates? Yeah, it's just me and Ozzy, you know, thinking what we're going to do because we knew we, we weren't uh, happy with the Sabbath situation at the time. Um, we didn't have any, hardly any money in the bank. You know, it was, uh, we were just thinking, well, we've done all these tours and sold all these albums and there's nothing to show for it. So what's the point in going on? And we were just uh, talking about, you know, maybe doing something, me and him together, just something different to get away from the, the chaos that was Sabbath at the time. Mm -hmm. And, but, uh, you know, he went his own way and I went back to Sabbath. Sure. Now, we were talking about some of the Dio years there a moment ago. You said in the book you've never listened to the live uh, the live Evil record because you didn't like the sound. You thought it was terrible. More recently, there's the new remix and the remaster. Have you listened to that? And do you think that's a lot better these days? To be honest, I haven't listened to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, the fans seem to really <laughs> like it. And the, the, you know, the feedback is that it sounds so much better. But the real reason I've had like this horrendous ear infection for the last three months mm -hmm. since they sent me like the uh, the first mixes and I just couldn't give my opinion because my uh, my left ear has has gone deaf. It's it's okay now, but um, yeah, I, the, the the album came out and I just couldn't I, I couldn't give my opinion on it because all the bass was gone from the ear infection <laughs> that I had. So I'll have to listen to it now that uh, it's cleared up. All right. Well, and I'm glad to hear that you're feeling better now as well. You know, Thanks. one of the one of the things over the years, rock fans always debate is the whole Devil Horns thing. You know, did Dio start that? Did Gene Simmons start that? Some people even cite John Lennon. And I was again in the book surprised that you say Dio actually approached you for permission to quote do that thing you do, and you show a picture of yourself doing the Devil Horns from back in '68. So. Were you the one that kind of brought the devil horn into metal and made it more popular? Yeah, I was the one. I always did it in the song Black Sabbath. That was yeah. my my thing. Like from 1968 onwards, I was doing the devil horns. <laughs> and when Ronnie joined the band on our very first live gig, everybody was doing the Aussie peace signs to him. Mm -hmm. And Ronnie just didn't know how to respond. And he saw me doing the devil horn thing in, in the song Black Sabbath. And a couple of nights later, he says, I, I just, I can't do the Aussie V sign thing. Can I, do you mind if I borrow what you were doing, the devil horn thing? Mm. I says, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so he, he did it in every song and made, <laughs> made it his, you know, and it's, uh, that's where it, he made it popular. Absolutely. Now for you, how different was it? Because in the 80s, then you joined Ozzy and, you know, recorded with him, toured with him on some of his solo albums. How different was it for you working with Ozzy in the 80s as him as a solo artist compared to working together in Black Sabbath? It was good because me and the, Ozzy's family and my family were really close anyway. Uh, with the, the kids were really, really close. We used to go on holiday together and everything. So it was just... Um, it was a lot of. Uh, it was easy for me because because uh, I didn't have to take the blame for anything, <laughs> or, or uh, you know, it, it, all the um, the responsibility of everything was mm -hmm. down to Ozzy, and it, I just felt relief, you know. So it was an easy gig for me to do, and uh, sure. we were good friends, you know. We were good. It was good uh, playing with him and everything at the time. It, you know, it's your best friend and the families were really close. So it's it an easy gig. Yeah. And in the book, you admit that currently you and Ozzy don't talk and it's really more so because of your spouses. You said you have no problem with Ozzy. So if he called you and he was doing another solo album, he said, hey, geez, I'd like you to throw a bass line on a song for me. Do you do it or is that you know not possible these days? Of course, yeah, of course I'd do it. Hmm. I That's mean, when we, spoke, we were supposed to meet up at... Uh, at the uh, Cam Commonwealth Games ceremony in Birmingham mm. last year, and Tony and Ozzy did this uh, finish, did the fine this final. I think they did Paranoid yep. to finish the Commonwealth Games, and I was supposed to be part of that. Really, oh. but unfortunately, I'd broken my rib, mm. and um, 
as I was recovering, I got COVID and I called Tony up and I said, Tony, I'm really sorry, man. I just can't do it. You know, I can't. They want, they're not going to let me on the plane anyway with COVID. Right. So uh, it was just down to Tony and Ozzy went ahead with it without me. Wow. So I know in the book you say that the Sabbath story is over for you, but if there's a one-off type thing like that, sounds like then you'd be open to maybe even joining them for something like a ceremony like that or a, perform- a quick performance? Yeah, if it was, uh, you know, if it was worth doing um, okay. and we were all into it, yeah, I'd do it a one-off. I would. I couldn't do it too, though, anymore. Sure, of course. That's understandable. You know, in the later years, obviously, you reunited both with Dio and with Ozzy and did, you know, the Heaven and Hell album, The Devil You Know, and the uh, the Sabbath album, 13. Do you have a preference over those two albums? Which one you like better? Um, Probably The Devil You Know, because mm. it was more, uh, we were all, we were all had a, a, a democratic input into it and... I don't know. It was, it was a lot more fun making that album. <laughs> sure. I think 13 just seemed to go on forever. And we had Rick <laughs> Rubin pro- uh, producing it, supposedly. And um, <laughs> but he, Rick Rubin worked great with uh, Ozzy, but uh, I don't think Tony really got on too well with him. Uh, so I, I preferred the Devil You Know album. Okay. Now, obviously, and you touch on this in the book, there was a lot of lineup changes over the years. On one hand, that kept the name Sabbath, Black Sabbath, you know, in the media and new albums and new music coming out. But on the other hand, it was like, well, who's in the band today? Do you think all those lineup changes helped or hurt the band's legacy? Um, For me, it it hurt the band because they were playing like small, really small venues and they weren't selling any albums or anything. And... uh, it was to me. I always thought, well, you wouldn't get Mick Jagger going out as the Rolling Stones, and you wouldn't get Jimmy Page going out as Led Zeppelin. So I always thought of it like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, Tony wanted to do it, so good luck to him. Sure. And I know, obviously, at one point you had just for a couple of shows, Rob Halford stepped in and you replaced Dio. Dave Walker was there for a few months. Do you think it could have worked long term with either of those two guys? Um. Maybe Rob, yeah, but not Dave Walker, no. No, okay, okay. Now, I have to give you credit in the book. You're very open that over the course of your life, you've suffered from depression, even paranoia at the time, and you share a story about how at one point you thought Ozzy and Tony was going to try to kill you. Um, so I want to just thank you for being open about that because so many people look up to rock stars and people like yourself and legends and say, what a life. And I'm hoping just from reading your book that maybe that could help somebody else to search out help and get help. Of course, you know, this is you know, taking care of yourself and mental health is an important thing. So I want to thank you for highlighting that in your book. Well, it, people just haven't, I mean, it's different these days because people are finally talking about it. Whereas in the, not so long ago, it was like it's such a stigma to it. People would think, oh, if he's, he's depressed and he's mentally ill, you know, you can't talk to him. He's a lunatic, should be in mm-hmm. there. But it's nothing like that. It's just like, Everybody has bad days, but when you depress, when you have like clinical depression, it's like the black hole, and you you can't remember what normal life is, and so you think that you're going to be feeling like this horrible feeling forever. Sure. And um, I mean, luckily now, you can get lots of treatment. There's different pills you can medic medicine that you can take, pills and stuff like that, or you can go to therapy. And people are open about going to therapy these days. I speak to a lot of people now about it. Yeah. And um and I think yeah, people should uh, definitely go and sort help if they can for when you get in those uh, depressive states because it took me years. It wasn't until uh, the late nineties, a doctor in St. Louis finally diagnosed me because up, up until then the doctors I used to go to was trying to explain what I was going through and they just say oh go and have a go down the pub or <laughs> take the dog for a walk you'll feel better mm. and it's like no it's nothing like that right. it's not like that. and finally this after I thought Ozzy and Tony were going to kill me and I didn't <laughs> realize I was I was having a breakdown at the time and I went to this uh, doctor in St. Louis and he said yeah, you're having a breakdown, you're depressed, and this is what you got to do. And yeah. he put me on the Prozac, which after like six weeks, it started to kick in. I felt really 
good again. That is, that, I'm so glad you shared that story with people. And, you know, one of the last things I want to ask you, Higgies, is, you know, in your book, you start by talking about your upbringing, your family, and your father not being necessarily sure of you pursuing a rock and roll lifestyle and, and joining a band. What do you think your dad would have said the night that you were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? He probably says, what's what's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? <laughs> That's great. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that answer. Were you happy that you were inducted or did it not mean anything to you? It didn't, it didn't really mean anything to, to us because we've been, you know, we've been, uh, we've been nominated 10 years in a row. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we just told Ozzy called them up and said, take us off the thing. We don't, we're not interested. Just, yeah. we don't want to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And, that as, as soon as he said that, they inducted us. <laughs> so when we says, "Well, we're not going to we're not going to be playing there," well, we'll turn up, but that's it. Right, it's as far as it will go. So, I money mean, doesn't really mean anything. Agreed. Well, you know, Giza, I could probably ask you a thousand questions. I want to be respectful of your time. The book is called "Into the Void: From Birth to Black Sabbath and Beyond." I know you could order it on Amazon. You get it online. Anything else you want your fans to know about, whether it's the book or anything else in your life and your career right now? Um, no, it's just I'm glad that uh, I've finally got the book out and hope they enjoy it if they're going to read it. Yeah, look, to me, it's an absolute great read, and I can promise anybody watching and listening, you guys will absolutely love it. Go check it out. Giza, I want to thank you for your time today. It's an honor to speak with you. And uh, thank you for all of the songs and memories throughout all the years and decades. Thank you so much, Giza. Oh, thanks, Mike. Thanks very much. Of course. Take it easy and be well. You too. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. All righty. There you have it. I'd like to thank Giza for joining me, talking all about his new book, Into the Void, From Birth to Black Sabbath and Beyond. Trust me, if you're a Black Sabbath fan, you're going to love this book. We only scraped the surface of some of the stories that are in there. You guys are going to really love it. I highly recommend you checking it out. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. If you're listening to one of my podcasts, subscribe over there as well. Also, head on over to Facebook and follow my page, The Rock Experience with Mike Brunt, where each and every day we talk about all the rock and roll music that you love. You could also follow me on Instagram and Twitter as well. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you all next time.